Welcome to my study. After 30 years, I've concluded that everything you need to know to be successful in every part of your life is found in one book, the Bible. Our subject today is friendship. The goal of reconciliation. So might as well take a look at my title slide. But before we get going here, I want you to see this. We've had three previous teachings on the subject of reconciliation. The first one was restoring broken relationships. So this is background for today's teaching. Then we did one on the how to uh, restore broken relationships. And then the last one we did was Bible Techniques of Reconciliation. And today, the culmination of this four-parter is this idea of friendship being the goal of reconciliation. It's why. It's the why behind reconciliation. <clears throat> so, if you haven't already, make sure that you review the previous three teachings because its background is kind of a setup for what we're going to learn about today, because we learn so many of the dynamic principles of what, what is necessary to restore a relationship, and especially we spent so much time on the subject of genuine forgiveness. And by the way, something else, there's a teaching on the website, nothingbutthetruth.org, called The Seven Aspects of Genuine Forgiveness. How do you know when you've really forgiven somebody? It's part of reconciliation. So, today, friendship, the goal of reconciliation, so here we go. Let's understand a couple of basic things up front. Number one, reconciliation is not salvation, but it can lead to salvation. God was in Christ, look at this, reconciling the world unto himself. And how did he do that? By not imputing their trespasses unto them. He just canceled them. I'm going to get them out of the way so we can have a talk. And he has committed unto us all the teachings on how to do this, the word of reconciliation. Now, I want you not to miss this, because to be reconciled is not to be saved. It's, it's, it can lead to salvation, as we shall see. But here's the truth. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through what Jesus did on the cross. Watch it. While we were enemies, this is staggering. Here is here we are, standing for everything God is against, and He wants to fix our relationship. And so He reconciles us. Watch this. But that doesn't save us. Look at this now. Much more, look at this now, much more than being reconciled, we can get saved by. His life in us. So reconciliation of itself is not salvation, but it can lead to salvation. Secondly, reconciliation is not a fix for broken relationships, but the basis of being able to fix. If there's no reconciliation, you can't fix the relationship. For example, in this scripture in Galatians 6, if a man is overtaken in a fault, if you're spiritual, that's kind of going to be really important. Restore such a one. And how do you do that? Not with attacks and onslaughts and verbal abuse, but you do it in the spirit of meekness. No anger, no wrath, no judgmentalism, no condemnation. We restore them in the spirit of meekness. And, and watch this now, and considering ourselves less Hey, we got our own faults, so be careful. But reconciliation is not the fix for broken relationships, but the basis. It's not a substitute for justice. Mm. So let every soul, this is a great chapter on this, by the way, be subject to the higher power. And it's talking about civil authorities, right? There is no civil authority, but that which is of God the civil authorities are designed by God to have a function. They're ordained by God. And if we resist the civil authority, 
we are resisting the ordinance of God, and if we do that, we, those that resist, shall receive to themselves. Yep. The consequence is not very nice. Because rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Now, what's going to be important for us here is to understand the difference between forgiveness and pardon. Somebody breaks into my house, hurts my wife, I'll forgive him, but he's still subject to justice. I don't have the legal right to pardon him. I can forgive him, but I can't pardon him. That's why we need a really good definition of pardon. So here it is. Pardon is an action on the part of an authority of a state. Okay? It had to be an authority. Releasing a person from punishment that is imposed by a sentence or that is due according to the laws. There's going to be a trial. He will receive the full options of a defense counsel, etc. He will be tried. But only a legal state authority can pardon someone. I am not authorized. I must forgive him, but justice still has to be done. Pardon still has to be executed. So, Reconciliation is not the same thing as justice. And in fact, uh, reconciliation is not bypassing correction. If a person be overtaken in a fault, we always get this hurt, don't we? Restore such a one. So they still have to be corrected. Just reconciliation of itself doesn't really reconcile someone to God. So, so these are the things we must understand. What reconciliation is not. It's not a substitute for refusing to enforce proper authority. For God says, I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee. That's what authorities are designed to do. I will correct thee in a measure, but I will not leave thee wholly unpunished, but Authority is going to happen. And, and so we have to understand that, in fact, uh, reconciliation is not a substitute. So watch here now. A little quick summary, and then we'll get to our main point. And it's this. Reconciliation is the starting point for salvation. It's the starting point for repairing relationships. It's the starting point for correcting others. It's the starting point for establishing authority. And here's our main point. It is the starting point for building friendship. Friendship is the goal of reconciliation. Now, let's talk about friendship. And, and in detail, we, mu we must understand what, it, what does it mean to have a friend, okay? So let's go to this definition. An alliance, but based on an alliance between two or more people, based on a state of mutual trust and support, okay, of two people or more people being united by mutual trust and support, and it's evidenced by having an affinity towards one another, and of course, there must be harmony. Otherwise, how can we call them friend? Now, I want to talk of one of the main issues that's really of vital importance. Before we do, though, I want to go back to... Oh, my goodness, my... I didn't go back. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's say I f I'm finished that screen right now. Okay, and now I'm going to go to close up.
So let me talk about the real important idea of friendship. And what is that? It's to become, if you can imagine this, this is staggering to the imagination I am supposing. It has to do with becoming, look at this now, a friend of God. And the scripture was fulfilled which says of Abraham, believe God, and he was called the friend of God. Could anything be more staggering than this idea that a human being can become a friend of God? Let's go back and take a look at what Jesus said. Henceforth, in other words, from now on, I'm not going to call you servants. We're going to come back to this verse, but watch this. For the servant doesn't know what the Lord's doing. But look what Jesus says to these disciples. I have called you friends. I have called you friends. Imagine. Yep, they followed him. Yes, they did what they were told. Yes, they were disciples. Yes, they served him. The day came, he said, that's all over now. From now on, I want you to understand that you're my friends. In fact, when it came to Lazarus, he called Lazarus his friend. And in one place, look at this, he says this. A whole group of people, I say unto you my, look at this now. I say unto you my friends. Jesus, friends. God being friends with people. This is an amazing concept and an idea. Now, in order to be friends with anybody, and with God as well, and what I want you to do now is to see, I want you to see two different truths in parallel. I want you to see the necessary terms of friendship with God, but I want you to see that these same principles apply with friendships horizontally with others. How can two people be friends? What are the necessary terms of friendship? So um, here we go. Number one, there must be agreement on essential issues. Have to agree on the essentials. It's based on this scripture in Amos that says, can two people walk together except they be agreed? If you want to go east and I want to go west, it's not going to work too good, right? I want to go north and you want to go south, not going to work. There must be an agreement on essentials. Now, here's the trick. The trick on this is to figure out the difference between essentials and non-essentials. What are the essentials? Now, we have a basic rule that we follow. Let me tell it to you in case you haven't heard it before. In essentials, there must be unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. So, there are certain things that are essential for two people to hold in common, or they cannot be friends. But there are lots of non-essentials, and the danger is that we should because we disagree with somebody, we should quit being their friends when it doesn't even matter. <laughs> like, I live in relationship with pastors and ministers and clergymen and evangelists, and etc. And so, we have to agree on some essentials. Like, you have to believe in God, for starters, right? If Jesus is God the Son and Son of God. That's an essential. And you have to believe in his virgin birth. And the blood of Jesus' ability to forgive, cleanse, and wipe away sin. Those are essentials. But I got some, some theological friends who think that Jesus is coming before the tribulation starts. I have other friends who think that Jesus is coming back in the middle of the tribulation. Some think at the end of the tribulations, and quite frankly, I don't care. He's going to come when he's going to come. I personally think the fireworks have already started. But it's a non-essential. What for me is an essential is something that has an effect on your eternal life. That 
is an essential. So, in terms of, in the necessary terms of friendship, there must be agreement on essentials. Secondly, there must be a willingness to be rejected by those who disagree with the essentials. Jesus put it this way, he that is not for me is against me. Well, he that is not for me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me is he's not part of the, you're either part of this problem or part of the solution. Jesus said you can't have it both ways. In fact, this is a shocking verse. Do you not know that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Why could that, how can that possibly be true? How can friendship with the world be at enemy with God? Answer is simple. Because the philosophies of the world and the philosophies of God are so diametrically opposed to one another, so diabolically opposed to one another, you can't go both ways. You're on one side or the other. Let's go back to that verse. So, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And whosoever will be a friend of the world, the world's way of thinking, living, behaving, doing, is the enemy of God because his ways are so drastically different. It goes on to say, do you think the scripture says in Vern that the spirit lusteth in envy? And in fact, the Lord says, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. He has a protective form of jealousy over us. It's so important. And then thirdly, the necessary terms of friendship requires that each person be willing to be vetted, hmm, checked out. In fact, vetted means subject to evaluation, uh, subject to examination, subject to uh, suitability assessment. That's what it means to vet somebody. Why is this vetting thing so important? And the answer is simply this. To give the position of friendship, which is a position of influence to someone who's an enemy. Imagine the consequences of giving the position of friendship, of influence to an enemy. Ah. So friendships have to be vetted. And here's a scripture in Proverbs. Make sure thy friend, now this is in financial matters, but there must be a vetting. Look at this. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. Why is that? Why is it that the companion of fools shall be destroyed? Because whatever a person is, is contagious, especially when given the position adjacency of friendship. They are contagious. So if you have a fool for a friend, that fool. The foolishness of the fool is likely going to affect you. Now, this is called the law of association. In fact, if you want to really learn the law drastically, not a very nice way, but uh, you go into a room with a skunk and close the door and you come out, everybody will know who you've been with. <laughs> it's called the law of association. And this is what happens with friendship. That's why the scripture comes. And this is what it says. Make no friendship with an angry man. Why? With a furious man thou shalt not go. Look at this now. Lest thou learn his ways. Ah, association. And you will get a snare to your mind, your emotion, your soul. So, a willingness to be vetted. Now, this is shocking. Take everyone. Watch out for your neighbor. Trust not in any brother. This is referring to an unvetted brother. 
For every brother will utterly supplant and every neighbor will walk with slander. Yeah, they're going to back, talk behind your back. They will deceive everyone as neighbor. They will not speak the truth. In fact, uh, they have taught their tongue to speak lies. The truth doesn't matter. And they weary themselves to commit iniquity. They don't care about being equal or right. And that, my friends, is a very dangerous position to be in without vetting, without checking them out. In fact, look at one more scripture with me. Trust ye not in a friend. The implication here is without vetting. Watch here. Put not confidence in a guide. Somebody's going to show you the way? How do you know he knows the way? That's why willingness to be vetted is an important part of friendship. Remember what vetting means? Subject to evaluation subject to examination and the willingness to have one's suitability assessed. So, in order to have genuine friendships, got to walk the same direction. Got to agree in the essentials. And for certain, need to be vetted. Now, the fourth term is this. A friend loveth at all times. In other words, you don't love part-time. You don't love about some things and not about other things. Loving at all times is critical. In fact, I heard somebody say this one time. He that quits being your friend never was. How could that be true? He that quits loving you never did. Because love never gives up. Loving at all times is critical. That's why God comes and he lets us know that he loves us. He loves us all the time. Look at this. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And because my love is everlasting, therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Oh, one of my favorite verses from Song of Solomon is, draw me and I will run after thee. <laughs> So he loves us all the time. He draws us, and I will build thee again. I will, I, will, I will never give up on you. That's why we need to know what it means to love at all times. So we must go to this great 13th chapter and discover the 16 elements of love. 13th chapter of Corinthians. Huh? So love suffers long. It can put up with a whole lot of stuff. It's kind. In fact, it's kind back to the ones that cause the suffering here, right? It envies not. It isn't jealousy over what other people have. If you love them, you're not jealous. You're happy that they have what they have. You don't envy them. And uh, love doesn't show off. Act big, act tough, act smarter than everybody else. Doesn't vaunt itself. It's not puffed up. It's not prideful, self-exalting. Uh, has good manners. That's what's meant by this. Does not behave itself unseemly. I mean, it has good manners. Um, it doesn't seek its own benefit, but the benefit of the one being loved. Seek it not her own. It's not selfish. It is diametrically opposed to selfishness. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't get put off very quickly. It's very tolerant. Love doesn't think the evil about another person. 
doesn't keep account of their wickedness, does not rejoice when things are not equal. In fact, uh, it rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, like, I mean, strong, it's tough. It can bear up under all burdens. It believes everything is good about a person until it's no longer possible to do so, but it keeps on believing. It's optimistic. It's optimistic. It hopes all things. That's a sign of optimism. In fact, it endures all things. And in fact, it never fails. The necessary terms of friendship, you see, include all the aspect of love. And this is not something we do once in a while or part-time, but all the time, every time, with someone who is a real friend. See, reconciliation is the clearing of the air that enables us now to put friendship together properly, come back into right relationship with one another, even though it was broken before. Reconciliation canceled all the past and sets us up so now we can be what we should have always been but weren't, but we can be now, two friends. Now here's where it really starts to get tough, though, because one of the terms of friendship is the willingness to correct and to be corrected. Mm. Let me ask you this. How correctable are you? How teachable are you? Like can, some, can anybody? <laughs> or are we such narcissists that we, when nobody could tell us anything anymore? We know it all. Right? You see, genuine friendship requires correcting and caring about one another sufficient to correct. This is a sign of love. Whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Oh, my goodness. If you love somebody and they're getting off track, going the wrong way, and it's going to face devastation, you want to correct them. Get them back on track. And so the Lord, who the Lord loves, he corrects. Even a father, a son in whom he delights, a father that doesn't care about his son is not going to correct him. In fact, a father who doesn't try to correct the son does not love him. The scripture says that clearly. Willingness to correct and be corrected. Sometimes the correction reaches this level of chastening. Ay, ay, ay. In fact, he scourges every son whom we see. If we don't respond to correction, we get chastened. I probably told this too many times that my dad, when I was a kid, sent me to my room and I had to wait forever. It seemed like forever. And my dad would walk in with a belt in one hand and a Bible in the other, and we always had a Bible study. And those were the Bible studies I wish could have gone on forever. <laughs> but they always came to an end. Listen, I became a Bible expositor at a very young age. I, he, my dad would say, uh, read the scripture, son. It says, spare not for his crying, for if thou beatest him with a rod, thou shalt not hurt him, but thou shalt deliver his soul from hell. And my dad would say, no, son, what do you think that scripture means? And I had to explain. <laughs> You're really delivering me from hell. And then the Bible study got over and my dad did the punishment. I think I told you this once before. One of the real important things at the end of all of those con confrontations, I'm going to call them. But they were really conversations. I'd have to go and ask my mother to forgive me if I'd wronged her. And I'd come back, my dad would wait in the room. And when I got back there, he'd put his hand on my shoulder, he'd look me in the eye and he'd say, son, you're forgiven. Now go have a good time. You see, when you love somebody, you correct them. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes to help somebody, you have to hurt them. So the scripture says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. 
You go to the doc, he's got a knife, he's going to cut you, but he's not going to hurt you, he's going to help you, he's going to heal you. See? The motive is so important. Look at this again. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Oh, but we should learn this. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. So iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Two men can walk into a room, not a man, a woman. A man is like iron, two guys with iron, and iron sharpens iron, sparks are going to fly. But when, they, when it's all over, they walk out of the room, they're buddies. They can handle that, but not your wife. Don't treat your wife like another man. She's not another man. She's gentler, softer. Ew, don't treat her like iron. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, here's a big one. What does that mean? It means to be true and constant in allegiance. To be, to be true and constant in loyalty and affection. And in fact, uh, to be trustworthy and dependable. To be faithful. How can two people be friends if one or both are not faithful to one another? Because what happens is one of the greatest tragedies that can happen in any human person's life is when somebody who they thought was a friend broke their trust, deserted them, walked away, cheated. Ah. I'm not sure anything is quite so violent. You can probably tell this if you listen to the songs that are being sung. Because so many songs are songs about hurt. Somebody who they thought loved them and left them. Deserted, gave up, betrayed. So I, I do want us to see this scripture because this is so severe. So um, I want you to go to the scripture. This is David's testimony. It was not an enemy that reproached me because if it had been an enemy, I could handle enemies treating me badly, right? And it wasn't somebody that hated me that did magnify himself against me because then I could have just hid myself from him. But it was thou. Watch this now. A man my equal. Somebody I look to for guidance. Somebody who was a really close acquaintance. How close? We talked a lot together. We, we talked about every subject. We took sweet counsel. We even walked to the house of God. We went to the church together. I'm not sure that there's anything so painful as betrayal. Broken hearts. A wounded spirit, who can bear it? To be betrayed by someone who you thought was a friend can leave damage for the rest of one's life. Ah, we think we can just wipe it out and go on and do something. Get a new friend. Get another relic. Get another. Doesn't work that way. We carry it with us unless we know the principles of redemption, how to get it back together again. But necessary terms of friendship requires faithfulness to one another. And then lastly, and lastly, there has to be transparency. In other words, shared secrets. I want to take you back to that verse where Jesus said, 
He said, now, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. Why? Why? Because a servant doesn't know what the Lord does, doesn't know what's going on. But I have called you friends for all things that I've heard of my father I have made known unto you. Now, sometime soon we should probably cover the seven leadership principles that Jesus taught. But one of them is called the No Secrets Principle. Here it is. Everything the Father showed me, I'm passing it on to you. You see, that's what friends do. They share with each other what they would never share with someone else. They can share it because there's trust, because there's transparency, because there's love. So in conclusion, let's take a brief look at Jesus' life. Because they criticize Jesus unduly, I think, because here's the story in a nutshell. He was friendly to everybody, but friends with the qualified. Don't miss that phrase. Friendly towards everybody, but friends to the qualified. So they accused him. Look at what they said. Why does your master eat with sinners and publicans? Why is he friendly to sinners and publicans? And Jesus heard them say this. He said to them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I am friendly because they need somebody like me in their lives. Look at this. And then he said to the disciples, but you need to go and learn what this means. You need to figure this out, guys. And this is what he says. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Because I'm not coming to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. I want to catch this phrase. It isn't your sacrifices and your gifts I want. I want you to be merciful. So we're not friends because we're going to get something back. We're being merciful. I have come to urge sinners, not the self-righteous, to come back to God. So he insisted in being friendly to all but friends only with the qualified. How serious was he about this? Huh. Take a look at this. Jesus said to Judas, and what did he call Judas? His friend. Why'd you come here? You remember. For 30 pieces of silver, he sold out, betrayed the Lord. So they laid hands on Jesus and they took him away to, in fact, be crucified. Jesus was friendly to everybody, but only a friend to the qualified. It's based on him obeying this. A friend, a man that has friends, must show himself friendly. Now watch this with my concluding concept here. But there is a friend that sticks closer than any brother. He that hath friends must show himself friendly, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. One young man told me about his prayer. He said, I ask God to send me a best friend. And God sent me his son. You can be friends with God. And if you are, look at this. You will also be friends. Here's one church, a group of our friends, salute thee. Greet the friends by name. Because the fact of the matter is, that any two people that are connected to God are best connected to each other. So 
don't forget that friendship is the goal of reconciliation. Thank you.